OK. Welcome, everyone. It's already um, our 12th class, rushing toward the final. I'm going to be brief tonight. We've got um, just a wonderful program for you tonight that really focuses on how people are addressing food systems change making and transformation through community. So I think you'll really enjoy this. We, we have Lewis and Vincent from Cafe Alone, who are, I think of as cultural entrepreneurs in their own right, doing really interesting work. And then two of my favorite former students who graduated in the last few years and are doing really interesting things to make change in the food system, Amanda Eller and Rachel Steinbau. And they'll be joining us in just a minute. Um, I wanted to spend a few minutes, since you were kind enough to come to class tonight, to give you a heads up on how to nail your final paper. Um, this class, as you know, has three primary learning objectives. First is to develop some sense of food systems intelligence. So that means we want you to be thinking and seeing in systems. Uh, the second is about ethical leadership. What does it mean to bring a set of core values, uh, a sense of purpose, and clear intention to your actions, to your plans, your actions, having a, while, a wide field of awareness about how your choices and actions impact other aspects of the system and making choices that um, really are informed by a commitment to the greater good. That's ethical leadership. And thirdly, a bias for action. Really, what does it mean to be empowered beyond yourself uh, with a sense of agency. And so what I'm hoping is that you'll take those three principles and you'll weave them into your paper in a way that we get a sense that you have grasped and internalized those concepts and have put them into work uh, in the paper. So I went a little more granular uh, if you want to take a look at this long list, but this is just Maybe, I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm not making this prescriptive, but if you want some guidance, what we're going to be looking for, it's you're going to be naming the problem you want to solve or the issue that you want to make better. You're going to want to describe your vision. That's the future that you imagine. You're going to name and define the core values that'll support your vision. You're going to describe the system in which the problem exists talk maybe about what the challenges and obstacles, where the concentrations of power or incumbent sources of habit or um, you know, kind of entrenched behavior are. And then you're going to talk about or identify the leverage points that you're going to choose to make meaningful change. And then talk about the pathways you'll pursue and maybe the ones that you choose not to pursue and tell us why. You might want to use the creative tension model that you learned earlier in the semester as a way to illustrate those pathways. You might talk about what mode of change making you want to employ. Are you going to be an entrepreneur and start a new uh, uh, enterprise? Are you going to be an organizer? Are you going to be a researcher or an academic or a journalist or an author or a chef? Which modes of change making are you going to use to make an impact? You might talk a little bit about what resources you think you're going to need to pursue this path. And we'd love for you to talk about like, well, what's the next thing you might do? What's that urgent next that you hear all of our speakers kind of bring up that they know that there's a next action that they can take, even if they don't know exactly where it will lead. And then we hope that you'll describe the impact that you imagine from your efforts. And remember, the paper can be about you, me, you know, the, the world that you inhabit. You might want to change something about um, your food life, or it could be larger. You might want to take on a, one of the problems or challenges that you encountered in one of the readings or in one of the guest speakers 
or one of the podcasts you listen to, or, or go beyond what was presented in class. But hopefully this will be helpful. This is a, just a guide. There's also more information on the rubric in the syllabus if you need it. And without further ado, I want to um, introduce Aniket, uh, who is the graduate student instructor in the Plant Futures Challenge Lab. Sure, use that mic. He wants to entice you to take another class now that you've taken this one. Thank you, Will. Um, good, afternoon, good evening, folks. So um, I'm here basically to publicize the Plant Futures Challenge Lab. And while listening to the course structure of edible education, I just realized um, while, if I might make this analogy, while edible education um, gives you the theoretical frameworks, tools, and skill sets um, to get a better understanding of the food systems and how it is transitioning, the Challenge Lab is a perfect complementary that gives you the practical skill sets um, and knowledge sets to, to tackle the transition in the food systems. Um, so the Plant Futures Challenge Lab is a three-unit um, three unit course which is cross-listed between the Haas School of Business and the School of Public Health. Um, it is offered to undergraduates, um, graduate students, MBAs, as well as PhD students. Um, Plant Futures, a nonprofit which was born out of um, UC Berkeley, offers this course and is on a mission to transform food, food systems to a more plant-centric, a plant-forward um, food paradigm. Um, so just to take you through, in a short time, just to take you through the structure of the Challenge Lab, um, as soon as you enter the Challenge Lab, you'll be paired with like-minded folks across disciplines, and then you will be, you will be paired with, with one of our Challenge Lab partners. In the past, we've had um, Beyond Meat, Plant-Based Food Association, Tofurky, Miyoko's, and all of these wonderful Challenge Lab partners that um, come in with impending problems in the food systems and their take on transforming it towards a more plant-centric um, future. Um, and students collaborate with these teams throughout the semester to bring, uh, to bring forward innovative solutions. Um, and finally, um, for non-Haas students, if you are interested in taking this class, um, we urge you to fill this um, priority form by April 16th. Um, and another piece of information is that this class will be held on Thursdays from four to six next semester. Um, that's about it. Thank you so much, Will. Aniket's been, a, Aniket's been an absolutely amazing um, GSI for the course. It qualifies for the food systems minor, the transforming food systems certificate, and the um, sustainability certificate too for MBA students. It also satisfies the applied innovation credit for MBA students. So. It's a great, uh, edible ed is the perfect prerequisite. So without further ado, I want to introduce you to our first guest speaker uh, tonight. Rachel Steinbaugh has come back to talk to us about her, what did you call it, a tipsy-turvy journey? Here you go. Yeah, thanks for a warm welcome. My mic is now on, <laughs> so that should make it a little easier. Hello, um, I am Rachel. I had a twisty and turny career journey to where I am now, which is Karana, a company that is scaling jackfruit um, to make delicious food products like dumplings and burgers and patties from jackfruit that we source from smallholder farmers in Sri Lanka. Um, I started out before coming to Haas, um, where I met Will and a lot of the other amazing people in this room, um, at a nonprofit called Village Health Works, where I was doing any and everything to help s build a hospital in rural Burundi. So I learned a lot about supply chains um, and how things move around the world in this role. Um, but what really kind of inspired me um, and got me really excited about that, about food, was being in the terraces of Burundi. Um, this was food that we were basically growing for patients at our hospital. Um, we would grow cassava, um, sweet potatoes, a lot of different food, um, and then feed it to our patients. Um, so it really got me thinking a lot about how food is medicine, how food moves globally around the world. Um, and I got really excited about exploring food, um, as well as climate change in general, when I got to Haas. 
Uh, while at Haas, I worked at App Harvest, which is a controlled environment agriculture company growing tomatoes indoors. Um, and I also worked with this really cool startup called Teza that's making plant-based cheese um, by matching microbes to soy milk um, and other types of milks. Um, so my journey really came together while I was at Haas, but um, I did a lot of things like exploring venture capital and looking at energy and talking to Amanda about solar in Nepal before I landed here. Um, so if you have any questions about how you can end up in a place that you really like, doing work that you really like, um, but by starting at a, at a place that you don't really see how that could all come together, um, I can certainly answer any questions on that front. All right, so I just wanted to tell you a little bit more about Karana, which is where I'm working now. Um, we are scaling jackfruit to drive reforestation and food systems transformation. Um, and we do that by working with farmers and markets where jackfruit is currently grown. We're currently sourcing from Sri Lanka, um, which is a country that has a very deep and rich history with jackfruit. Some of you may know a lot more about that than I do. Um, and we're also looking at new geographies, um, some in Latin America, you could hypothetically grow jackfruit in Hawaii, a bunch of other places, and seeing how introducing jackfruit trees could increase biodiversity of um, maybe a mango farm or a farm that's growing vanilla or coffee or cocoa, um, and how you could introduce a tree to provide shade, and how as our climate changes um, and as heat becomes more and more of a problem for crops all around the world, um, we can use jack trees, which create food without a lot of fertilizer, um, to help these biodiverse systems stand up. Um, we then basically take that jackfruit, but we aggregate it across our network of farmers, um, working with amazing local partners, be they NGOs and government organizations, um, or for-profit companies that bring food together um, and sell them to companies like ourselves. Um, and then we have some intellectual property, tech, and data that we um, basically use to make the jackfruit into a really delicious end product that is a lot closer to a meat substitute one-to-one -one than a jackfruit shred, which some of you may have tried. You know, they sell them at um, Trader Joe's now. I saw a sliced jackfruit at Whole Foods the other day, so <laughs> jackfruit is definitely gaining attention, um, which is awesome to see. But we basically take it and make it super easy to make a meat substitute in a dumpling and put it in an industrial line um, and have a company that hasn't used plant-based food in the past uh, or plant-based ingredients in the past because they're, they don't really like what they're seeing on the market, um, give them an option that they can use. Um, that's a pretty whole ingredient that we don't really do all that much to to make into this awesome end product. Um, we do you know, add a little ingredient like salt or oil that you would know. Um, and then we, on the consumer-facing side, work really closely with uh, different restaurant partners uh, with different chefs um, and we try really hard to make sure that our food is absolutely delicious at the cutting edge um, and that we're using it in all these amazing recipes um, and that's a food that people want to eat um, in different you know dishes um, and really experimenting with that to make sure that we're making products that people really really like um, and keeping on top of that uh, it's really important to us to be very food-centric. Um, we definitely identify as a company of foodies. So this is kind of just another way of talking about what I just said. Um, we have all these partners, farmers, aggregators, et cetera. Um, we own a lot of the process in the middle there from everything at the farm gate down through distribution to restaurants at the end of the line. We distribute currently to restaurants and industrial co um, customers. So we'll work with a company that wants to do a direct-to-consumer Xiaolong Bao, for example, um, which is a really fun one. We have in development right now. But I wanted to talk to you a little bit more about our decentralized sourcing network and the farmer end of the spectrum, um, since we're thinking a lot about community today. Um, and starting off with this um, basic, an example where it was pretty difficult for our farmers um, and pretty difficult uh, for the existing food system to handle a change um, that had happened in Sri Lanka, which is where we source our jackfruit from. So it's actually in the spring of 2021. I updated that, but didn't change it on uh, these slides. But um, the government tried to shift the, the country's farmers from organic farming to organic farming overnight. Um, so basically all these farmers that have been using fertilizer uh, for, all, for as long as they could remember um, had to stop using fertilizer overnight because of a decree by the government. Um, the government said that 
it was going to save them a lot of money, $400 million in fertilizer. Um, and the result of the po policy, which was really felt in 2022, was that food costs were up 57% in a country where that is not something that most families can stomach. So nine out of 10 families were skipping meals. Uh, many Sri Lankan farmers, like the man pictured here, um, were, had a lot of spoiled crop because they had intended to raise their crop with fertilizer, but weren't able to. Um, and it just raises this interesting question, I think, about how we're, a lot of our food systems are very reliant on things like fertilizer, for better or for worse. Um, and crops like jackfruit are pretty interesting in the context of this sort of crisis because they, the jack tree does not require fertilizer to grow. Um, and historically, Sri Lanka has actually relied on jackfruit as a um, crop that we would use to, in times of trouble. Um, basically, it's a food that people eat when there's food insecurity. This happened in the 70s um, when there was a, a huge inflation incident. Um, and during this time, that actually was happening too. Um, and we checked in with our farmers. We, we really wanted to understand if we were taking food from the country that was very much needed. Um, but it, it's a very interesting relationship that countries like Sri Lanka have with jackfruit um, as a very resilient crop um, that can be a source of nutrition in times of need. Um, and I think this, this brings me to a question that internally we've been talking a lot about at our company, which is who gets to define what regenerative agriculture is in varying contexts around the world? Because for instance, um, here we don't have jack trees, so we don't talk a lot about biodiverse systems that include jack trees. Um, but in Sri Lanka, I certainly would think that people would look to the jack tree as a form of biodiversity and regenerative systems um, that is rooted in the cultural context of the place um, and the historical context. And um, it's just something that we've been thinking a lot about because as we get to a place where regenerative agriculture may become more defined, what does that mean for our farmers who are already kind of growing this food without a lot of fertilizer? Um, what are the, the rules and regulations that define this and who gets to define them? Um, I certainly believe that labeling things in a certain way is helpful because for end consumers, um, but I think that it's also important to think about what the consequences might be for um, farmers in places like Sri Lanka. It's a question I don't really have an answer to, but wanted to raise it with you. Um, so this is Sisiri Kumara. He is not one of our farmers, but he is someone who we will likely add to our network in the next um, few years, actually maybe months really. Um, we, a bunch of my colleagues met him a few months ago when they went to visit Sri Lanka. Um, and I wanted to share a little bit about him because he is a very typical Sri Lankan farmer. Um, he farms on about two acres of land, um, which is pretty typical in Sri Lanka. He mostly farms tea, but is starting to diversify because he is pretty worried about the pricing of tea right now. Um, he is thinking about different income streams um, for his farm. Uh, he has two jack trees on his land right now, and he's not selling them commercially. Um, he eats, he and his family eat uh, the fruit every once in a while on the farm, but actually about 60 to 70% of jackfruit globally goes to waste. Um, and in Sri Lanka, it's somewhere in that range as well. I think about 50 to 60% of it goes to waste in Sri Lanka. Um, and he can't use fertilizer, so um, crops like tea are less productive. Um, Let's see, yep, great. Um, and where Karana I think is interesting and where our business model is interesting from a social impact standpoint is that we have done some studies uh, in a new market that is not Sri Lanka that show that uh, income can increase up to 40% for farmers um, who join our sourcing network um, and start selling to us. Um, and in our existing market, Sri Lanka, uh, when you add about two jack trees to your land, a farmer can experience uh, a, a couple hundred dollars in income increase uh, over the year. And if you add five or more trees, um, it ends up being in the thousands of dollars added to annual income. Um, so it's a pretty exciting opportunity for farmers that we're working with. Um, and we're seeing a lot of interest, particularly in these existing markets and even in the new ones. Um, we've had a lot of conversations with farmers who really do want to keep in touch with us, are really excited, really want to know what we're up to and when we're planning to source from there because they are really excited about the potential income stream and see how it fits into their future um, from both an income perspective and from their plans for their farms. Um, 
from an environmental standpoint, we also see a lot of waste reduction when we were working with farmers in this pilot study in a new geography. Um, we, about a third of food produced is wasted, wasted globally. This is probably a statistic you've seen, um, but by so significantly reducing waste, um, we can leave more income in farmers' pockets uh, because there's more that they're able to sell. And it also potentially reduces methane emissions caused by food waste on their farms, um, which we're very excited about. Uh, and in terms of productivity increases in this pilot study that we did, um, we saw two times, we estimate actually that there will be a two times increase in productivity, meaning uh, because basically we are buying young jackfruit instead of ripe jackfruit. So a lot of farmers these days are selling ripe jackfruit, which is a sweet fruit. Um, and what we are doing to make our product is picking it young, which then increases the productivity of the trees. So they produce more fruit. Um, and we're, we actually saw five times increase in productivity. Um, it was during the most fertile time of year, um, which is why we're calling it two times because we need to see the next six months of data before we're sure about this. Um, but it's a really, really exciting outcome. Um, and we were able to do this in collaboration with farmers and this is why they're so excited about working with us because they're seeing the potential benefits that they would experience from selling to us. Um, selling fruit at a similar cost, but selling twice as much of it. Um, so yeah, that was everything that I had for you all. Um, I'm very excited to take your questions at some point soon. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah. director at the Waverly Street Foundation. Waverly Street is a philanthropic foundation. So we have um, an endowment, money that we invest and make grants to organizations that are working on solutions at the intersection of climate change and community priorities. And I'll say a little bit about what that means for us. took several Will's classes, and so these really were I mean, instrumental in putting me on this path to focusing on the food system. So um, it's really fun to be back here and to be kind of on the other side of it. Um, so centering, for us, we, we believe that centering communities is a winning climate strategy. And, and what that means is that often when particularly people in power think about climate change, they think, okay, this is an emissions problem. So we need to find the sources of emissions and then the technical solution to that source of emissions and, and then problem solved, right? Um, and, and maybe as they're deploying that technical fix by like step seven or eight, they ask, oh, what do you really think about this solution that you came up with? Um, and so we wanna kind of invert that and instead start by asking who is most impacted by the climate crisis and what do they care about? in their day-to-day -day lives, what are their top priorities? Because it's probably not emissions, it's probably affordable housing or public transit. Um, it might be access to affordable, healthy food. When we think about especially things like diet-related disease, it might be clean air, clean water. And then looking at all those priorities and mapping them back to climate solutions. And, and for us, it's been investing in that intersection. And food systems provide such a rich array of, of things that sit at that intersection. When we think about on the climate front, um, the food system in the US is responsible for, say, agriculture is about 11% of emissions. But if you think about worldwide, it's closer to 30% of emissions. But um, in terms of community priorities, there's so much there, whether that is um, thinking about, about farmers that are beholden to the monopolistic agribusiness interests or whether we're thinking about, um, about, about farm workers, whether we're thinking about diet-related disease burden, there's a ton of community priorities that, that we can map, um, map on, on the climate side. Um, and so for us, this isn't just about oh, Mike. It's close with me? OK, thank you. How's this? Good? A little better. Yeah. Um, I'll talk louder. And so for, is, for us, this isn't just about um, this is the right thing to do, which it is, but it's also about we believe that this is a winning strategy because when we are promoting climate solutions that speak to what people really care about in their day-to-day -day lives and not just about emissions, 
that's how we can build a bigger tent and broader coalitions. And that's how we're going to build the kind of momentum that we need to really meet the scale and the urgency of the climate crisis. Um, and we also know that the people that are the least responsible for causing climate change are also disproportionately bearing the burdens of its effects. And so we believe it's important not only to be investing in solutions that benefit those communities, but ideally are also coming from those communities and being led by folks in those communities because they're the people who are on the ground experiencing it. They're closest to the problem, and so they're best positioned to know what's actually going to work to solve it. Um, and those communities, we know they don't want business as usual. They don't want the world, after we fix climate change, to look exactly the same, only without the emissions. They want change that's going to really speak to the things that they care about and the problems that they have in their day-to-day -day lives that are intertwined with the reasons why we have these emissions problems, but are not just so narrow that you can just like fix the emissions thing and, and everything's going to be better. They understand that this is a systems change problem and we need systems change in order to really solve it. Um, and so to illustrate how, well, how this looks in the context of the arc of federal climate policy, for example, um, over the last two years, the Biden administration has passed a really big historic climate legislation. And, um, and it took decades, right? It took like 30 years of trying to get climate legislation through um, the US Congress, which is stunning. Um, and the last time that we got close was 2009 with Waxman-Markey. And Waxman-Markey was this cap and trade bill that was this more of like a narrow, like, okay, we have to fix the emissions problem approach. And, to, um, and so cap and trade means that you cap the amount of emissions that companies can put out and then you allow them to trade within those caps. And that um, legislation ultimately failed. And it, a lot of people believe that it failed because it was, it was too narrow and people didn't really see, you know, outside of the environmental community, people didn't really see like, how is this gonna benefit me? They failed to build a big enough tent. And I think that there was a lot of learning from that. And so if you look at how the Biden administration approached this climate legislation, the, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, they approached it by saying, OK, we're taking a whole of economy approach. We're going to build industries and build jobs and invest in projects and communities all over the country. And a real hallmark of their approach was um, what they call the Justice 40 Initiative. And the Justice 40 initiative says that at least 40% of the benefits of federal climate investments have to benefit disadvantaged communities. And so we'll see, like devils in the, in the execution, um, how this actually plays out when the money's flowing out the door. But I think that this aspiration and this commitment by the administration really went a long way in building that kind of um, broad base of support that we needed to get climate legislation across the finish line. Um, so in my work, I'm using a uh, just transition framework to think about um, how do we move to this better food system and think about what, you know, what does it mean to invest in systems change to get us from this current state of an extractive agricultural food system to a regenerative one, to one that is better for people and planet. Um, and this is a framework that I, I adapted from um, the Climate Justice Alliance. So credit is really to the Climate Justice Alliance for developing it. I just kind of adapted it to be specific to food systems. Um, but I think what you, what you see from it is that we need all of the things on this slide in order to move to this better vision, to this better place where we want to get. So we need to be stopping the, the monocultures and the factory farms and the exploitation. And we need to be building up these new, better alternatives. We need both. We need to be divesting from power that's held by like the monopolistic few. And we need to be investing in the many, in the diversity, in their regeneration. Um, and, and throughout all of that, we need to be changing the rules because we know that policy and markets are really um, stacked in favor of, of the status quo right now. And so none of that kind of change is going to be sustainable or at scale if we don't simultaneously change the rules. And so what does it take to, to make that kind of change? Um, it really takes building a movement. And so in my work, I think a lot about um, where do we put money? Where do we make grants? Who do we fund in order to achieve that kind of change? And so when I started in this role uh, three years ago, 
I had, before that, I had been working for an agricultural technology company, and I've been working with farmers in the Midwest who are growing corn and soybeans and meat on, um, on markets, on the grain markets, commodity markets, and on crop insurance. And so what I was seeing there was like, our policies and our subsidies are really incentivizing all these things that we say we don't want. They're incentivizing factory farms, they're incentivizing monopolies. And so you know, the thing is we have to change the farm bill. We have to change these policies and these subsidies or else you know, nothing, nothing is gonna happen. And so I spend a lot of time and I still do spend a lot of time working with organizations, with grassroots activists and advocates who are trying to change the farm bill. And that is amazing work and it is such important work. But what I learned from doing that work is that in order to build a movement, you need people power and you need the people. And I felt like there, there um, a lot of farmers in rural communities don't see how climate policy is gonna benefit them. And they feel like right now, while maybe, mono, um, maybe these monocultures and these factory farms aren't great, it's what they have and it's what their livelihoods are based on. And it's scary to think about we're gonna take it away without providing a credible alternative for what life is gonna look like on the other side in a way that they can believe like my life's gonna actually look better when we come out the other side of this. And so we have a lot of work to do on base building and kind of taking a big step back and thinking about how do we model what it looks like to build a really, a truly regenerative local food economy this, you know, this vision that we talk about, what is, like, we need to show it in real life so people can look in their backyards and see, oh, that's what that's gonna look like. Okay, I believe it now. I'm gonna be okay through it. Um, and then it's local base building. So thinking about, um, what are, the, what are the local causes and, and issues and campaigns that people care about, again, in their own communities, in their own backyards, so that we're building that kind of infrastructure and organizing muscle at a local level before we can think about winning at the top. Um, we need to be building that out across the country. And so I work with organizations all around the US. Um, I also do a lot of work outside the US, but kind of focusing this on, on the food systems work within the US, who are, who are doing all of these things and thinking about then how do we ladder that up and, and um, support all of it in, um, in pursuit of this kind of national movement building that we'll need to, to win something like a farm bill change. So I wanted to share a couple examples of some of the organizations that we work with that are doing really inspiring work on building a better food system. Um, this organization is called Agricultura Network. They are based in New Mexico. And their, their leader is this woman, Elga Garcia Garza, who is uh, incredibly inspirational. Um, so they're a uh, cooperative of farmers of color who are um, practicing regenerative agriculture in New Mexico. And they have, um, they've worked to change supply chains for public institutions within their region. So not only are they working together to process their produce and, and clean it and package it and get it out to market, but then they've gotten local hospitals, universities, school districts to source from them and even change some of the laws around this within the state of New Mexico so that um, not only are people who are going to the hospital or, or at a university cafeteria getting healthy, fresh, local produce that was grown by these local farmers, then the local farmers have access to markets that allow them to have viable businesses. And my, my favorite story about Helga is um, when, so in a lot of these rural areas, as many of you may be familiar, Dollar General is this like huge, is, you know, kind of taking over a lot of parts of the US. So a lot of communities where there's not a supermarket anymore, there's a Dollar General. And that means that you can't go to the store and get fresh local, fresh food because the Dollar General doesn't sell fresh food. So she started going to the Dollar Generals and asking, would you carry our produce? And they said no. And she kept working on it and escalating it. And finally, she decided, well, they seem to care about their shareholders. I'm going to go buy some stock in this company. So she bought stock in Dollar General. And she showed up enough so that she could show up at the annual shareholder meeting. And then she went up to the CEO and said, will you carry our produce? And he was like, well, I'll think about it. And so now they're working on developing lines of fresh um, salsas, of uh, dried fruit snacks, natural dried fruit snacks, and organic baby foods that the Dollar Generals can carry from their farmers. 
So just such a cool example of, I think, modeling what it looks like to build this robust regional regenerative food system that supports a really diverse um, kind of array and community of, of farmers in that place. Um, the, the next example I'll share is the Center for Good Food Purchasing. So we're thinking, again, more at like the school district level, the city level. Um, there are all these institutions like universities that purport to be about um, taking care of their communities, right? That's why they exist, is to, to help their communities. And yet, if they're sourcing foods from these big food monopolies that are you know, sourcing from factory farms and exploiting workers and doing all these things that are then causing harm, then they're not really living into their mission. And so the Center for Good Food, food Purchasing is a nonprofit. It's actually based here in Berkeley. And they work with school districts and cities and, and universities across the country to, um, to help them to align their procurement to their values. And so it's been really kind of, it's an interesting movement and we work with a bunch of different partners that are working on different aspects of this, but how do we align procurement from public institutions with these kinds of values that we would want to see in, in a better food system? And then the last example I wanted to share is the National Young Farmers Coalition. Um, so this is a, a national network across the U.S. of young farmer member chapters. These are member-driven chapters of young farmers that organize and come together um, to learn from each other, but also to think about what issues do we care about, what do we want to kind of get together and work on together. Um, and they do a, a big survey every couple of years to understand, you know, what's the state of young farmers in the country. We know that the average, I think the average age of farmer, a farmer in the U.S. is like 68 years old or something. So farmers are really aging and it's incredibly difficult for young people to break into farming. And um, the number one issue that, that they always tend to come up with is land access. Land is so, so expensive. And so that means that there's a lot of young people who care about climate change, who want to farm really as like a public service, right? It's, it's something that they want to do because they're passionate about it. It's not about getting rich, but they can't get land because land is so unaffordable. And so they have a 1 million acres for the future campaign. They're working actually on federal policy but as well as on, on state and local policy in the places where they have member chapters to really push for, we need land reform, we need land to be more accessible to young farmers, to farmers of color, to these communities that want to farm in ways that are more sustainable, and that's why they want to get into it, and they just haven't been able to. So, um, so that's a bit about, about the kind of work I do, just to give kind of a sampler of some of the organizations that, that we support. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to chat with anybody after or, or share more about, um, I think Will's gonna call us back up to share yeah. about our career. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. I'm gonna just, Rachel, come on up. We'll just talk for a few minutes. Um, have a seat, please. I, I love um, tonight's discussion, just to see the different models at work, um, the agriculture, example is so interesting to, to kind of work within a system. I mean, you have this piece that's so, um, so enriching to the farmers and the communities and then the access to the food. And then you still have the gigantic um, concentration of power corporation, you know, still in the supply chain. So it's kind of interesting to com you know, contrast that with the Cafe Ohlone vision of really creating a whole new system or grow, you know, an emergent system out of the system that's not necessarily dependent, but is kind of cooperating. So I guess, you know, a, an, a common theme tonight is just the cooperation that's necessary between the established models and the emergent models. And how do you navigate you know, in a way that, like you said, Amanda, that the future we want actually results and it doesn't just repeat. Right. Yeah, and I think, I mean, it's such an honor to follow um, Vincent and, and Lewis tonight. Um, I think when, you know, when we think about this, this future that we want, it does, it requires imagination because it's, you know, the system that we're in right now looks so different, I think, from the, the food system that many of us want. And it requires like this creativity and this imagination that I think that, that you two bring um, that that to me, like that's a climate solution because that's like, it, it almost requires a leap of faith to say, 
how are we going to get to a place that we've never seen before? And that's like that, that's like artistry. Um, so so I, yeah, I think what you all are doing is, is so cool and it's such an important part of that arc of like how do we get from here to there? Right, and you're 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 bringing you're bringing this. Um, this very large foundation now along too. I just, in your, in your presentation, I appreciate that you've brought, you know, you've brought the language of winning, you know, the metaphor of winning the, the kind of corporate strategy overlay because there's an expectation that you'll have impact. You have the privilege of having these resources and then you're sort of called to make sure they're used in the most effective way really so there's you know and it, it it's it but it's still part of the system that we you know we live in totally so, i think there's you know there's this expectation of like metrics and you know we want to see measuring the, impact. To measure the impact yeah. and see the success and it has to be right. tangible and there has to be numbers to it and we're talking about something like power building community organizing and power building is like a really lend itself right. to putting numbers on things. But I think being able to kind of connect it into that story of, you know, this is how we win. Um, that is the language that. Right. My hope is that beauty will <laughs> emerge as a value <laughs> in your work. It, it does quietly. It's just yeah. not, I, I know, but Rachel, you've got this really interesting tension too, between, you know, helping farmers, um, you see five trees is a good thing. Right. They might, they might not. Right, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you're trying to create a market for some kind of a foreign object in our, our lives. But many people might not even, you know, have encountered a jackfruit or wouldn't recognize it. Right, yeah. Um, it's something that's edible. Oh, no, I certainly have been thinking that when I've seen jackfruit in Whole Foods these days. <laughs> I wonder what most shoppers passing by are thinking as they look at this. Um, cause there are some who are very familiar with it because they're eating jackfruit is a very common thing that people have done for many, many hundreds of years. Um, but in places like this where it's not as familiar, um, to people who maybe aren't from parts of the world where it's been eaten, um, I wonder what they think when they see it in the grocery store. What is your role at Corona? Are you doing everything? Kind of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, it's a Business small... Business operations manager. It's a right. very small company. There are less than 10 of us right now. Um, but we already have built supply chains from Sri Lanka to Singapore, which was the market we started in um, and where we have a really great community of support um, and some really great restaurant partners already. So what um, makes you gravitate to those kind of opportunities? Like, because, you know, you got your degree in prestigious university. You could go <laughs> work for a big consulting or accounting or yeah. what, why do you want to be in a company that's reinventing or? Yeah. Well, I think what really drew me to Krana specifically was that it kind of seemed like this place where a lot of my interests and experiences came together. Um, having worked in Burundi, which is a place that many people in this room probably haven't been to. Um, it, and then coming to Haas was a bit of a shift in my life. Um, I was working with these really incredible folks who were 10 hours ahead of me and spending a lot of time on Google Meets, um, trying to br bring what knowledge I could, but also elevate the knowledge that they were bringing that may not have been listened to in the same way that I was hopeful that people, you know, would want to. But, uh, you know, in conversations about, oh, what sort of medicine do we need or how are patients um, handling all of this or what is the next step here? Um, I was seeing a lot of resistance to the knowledge of my local colleagues. So I tried to just really elevate, repeat, um, make sure that what they were saying was being heard. Uh, and I find that I have a lot of similar work to do at a company that is very global in nature. Um, and that definitely doesn't mean, you know, I'm certainly not right all the time and I don't do it right all the time. And I've never, <laughs> never claimed to do that. Um, but I'm drawn to that aspect of it um, very much so. And I also really enjoy, yeah, that we're working with farmers who actually see the benefit, you know? And we really do try to do this in community. That's why we do these pilot studies where we're working shoulder to shoulder with farmers and trying to see like does this drive benefit for you and if it doesn't maybe we shouldn't be working in this geography or maybe we should be questioning you know whether this business model stands up in the end i, I really respect that approach any questions for amanda or rachel i don't want to usurp the time but i'll i'll ask one more yeah. i'm just really proud of both of you to go on to do the things you do i think 
one of the things that's interesting about Berkeley Haas is we've got this little business as not usual business school mm -hmm. here. It's not, not the norm really. Yeah. A lot of business schools don't embrace or think about what business not as usual might look like and provide the kind of space and environments like this to explore how to reinvent and reimagine. So um, I guess just do you have any advice? I mean, a lot of the people in this room are thinking about how do I get to the job where my values can be expressed and be aligned with who I am and maybe tell us a little bit of story how you, you thought about that you know, in the past. Well, I so appreciated Rachel's presentation because it's also like the topsy turvy thing, and I think we've had really similar similar journeys too. Um, it's so easy in retrospect to look back on my career and see like kind of connect all the dots, and it seems like it makes so much sense. And um, and yeah. then while you're in it, it it doesn't at all. It feels like oh, I'm all over the place. I keep making these random left turns in my career, and um, and I think being in school, being a student, whether you're undergrad or whether you're in grad school, is such an amazing opportunity to like test drive different hypotheses. I did so many internships to just say like, do I like this? Okay, well I like this, you know, you do an internship and you say, what do I like from it? What do I not like from it? What can I learn for the next one? Until you get to the place where you feel like, okay, this actually kind of, this make, this kind of lights my fire up. This is, this is a good thing for me. I think I even remember you experimenting with almost starting a company. I did, yeah. I talked to, I, yeah, yeah. In, in one of Will's classes, I yeah. worked on starting a, a plant-based meat alternative startup. Um, and it was a good experience. I, it, may, yeah. it may still happen someday. <laughs> good, it's in your back pocket, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, I, I remember when we first chatted a few years ago, finding a lot of parallels in our paths, so. Um, it is very funny how you can look in retrospect and think that it all made sense, but <laughs> at the time it didn't always feel that way. Um, but yeah, I think definitely experimenting while at school was a big thing for me. I did a lot of different internships and I think understanding that there's a difference between a functional role and what you'll be doing on a day-to-day -day basis um, and you know the mission of the place that you're at was really important for me early in my career. I started out fundraising at the nonprofit that I ended up doing international operations for. Um, and fundraising was not a good fit for me at a nonprofit. I really didn't like it um, because the day-to-day -day was just oriented around things, that, tasks that I didn't like to complete. Um, and it was <laughs> very nice to then move on and to be able to say at a very small nonprofit, hey, I really like it here, but I don't want to do that anymore. It seems like we're building this hospital and that's picking up. Can I move that way? Um, and I advocated for myself, said, you know, this is what my job description would be. Um, and that gave me the chance to test out new skills that were much more aligned to what I like to do on a day-to-day -day basis. So and understanding that those things aren't always aligned and also being okay being wrong. You know, you end up at a place and you realize that it maybe isn't for you in the long run. That's okay. It's a part of your journey. Um, you learn from it and you take that with you to the next one. Wise, wise words. Thank <laughs> you. Well, tonight we really saw and experienced a lot of um, vision and values, intention, uh, in action on these journeys that are rich with purpose and um, serendipity. So on that note, I will um, invite Diana to share with you the, uh, we don't have any new assignment tonight. So just the, you want me to flip ahead here to the yes, please. 